Hey, welcome to the show today. Today, we're going to be talking dynamic warmups and how important it can be to perform at your best. If you're playing slow pitch softball like Marlon's doing all the time, any kind of recreational activity, or maybe you are just working on the treadmill, a dynamic warmup is essential. You said uh, last time that you're doing some type of warmup. Is that right? Anytime that I work out or I'm going to compete in softball, or even if I'm going to play golf, I got to get my body warmed up. I want to have my confidence mentally and physically before I start competing. I wanted to make this video because, you know, I don't know how many times as I've gotten older, I'm around guys that are doing, you know, you show up and you're going to play golf. You show up and you're going to play slow pitch. You slow and you do any type of exercise format. And the idea that no one warms up is just like mind boggling to me. When you're a kid, you warm up every time. You got the coach telling you to do X and do this and do that. It's, it's kind of weird. Where do you think... Do you think it's just laziness? People don't work, warm up? I think it's laziness and it's just a habit for me. Well, if I'm going to play softball, I want to throw the ball. I want to run some. I want to swing a bat. If I'm going to play golf, I like to hit some off of the practice tee. I want to get ready before I go out there and try to do it. I just can't do it cold. Well, and that's where you get all the injuries. All the injuries come from your body just not being athletic and being ready to make some of those movements. You know, I, I've played golf several times. I don't play a ton, but, you know, you get out there with a bunch of guys and everyone, you know, you got backs locking up by hole 13 because, you know, they're not at all warmed up and they were swinging a tight muscle. I mean, that's kind of the essence of the warm up is you're trying to make sure everything's ready to rock when it's time down the road. It's not even right now. It's what happens after an hour or two of doing this type of deal. Are the muscles already getting strained? Are they getting fatigued? You know, when you are out at the softball field, is there a particular thing that you always start with? When I get there, I want to start with the legs, and then I'm going to do some lower back, yeah. and then I'm going to do some upper body. Best way to do it. You, you got to get the legs going. Uh, legs basically drive the blood through the entire body. That's going to make your shoulders looser, going to do all those types of things. So legs, are you doing uh, a resisted format, or are you, you know, we work with K-bands all the time. I know that you use those a lot. I always use the K-bands. I want that resistance. It gives, I can go faster and way more effective with that elasticity, and I'm kind of pushing through the resistance, but it's at my pace. Whether I go fast or slow, the, the resistance is going to do what I do. Right. We, we were talking earlier, and I would highly recommend that before anyone does any type of exercise, you've got to do a little bit of a blood flow thing. I know you were talking about right into resistance with squats, but quite frankly, adding like just a slight jog, I mean, just moving the body around a little bit, walking quickly, but most likely once you move into that jog atmosphere, so much more blood flow. So if you're playing softball, take a little jog from pole to pole, come back, then start that. You know, if you're playing golf or something like that, just find a little bit of an area, you know, sit in the parking lot, get your heart rate up just a little, walk quick, maybe a slight little jog, and then those motion, those big compound movements when you're swinging through the ball, softball, golf ball, those types of things, it's going to be a little bit easier to get through your dynamic warm-up. Now, after you do your squats and things, uh, are you going for depth right away, or you're using that cold turkey like, you know, this is range of motion A, and we're going to get to C, or how does that look? I started... A and then go B C. Yeah. I'm not gonna go deep on a squat and, and go Ooh, the, the gears don't dude, like it. <laughs> that, you know, my body's sixty four. Remember sure. that. Yeah, sure. But it really helps. So you think that doing the pole or whatever you would do is a good way and I would probably do that unresisted because it and that might tire me out pretty quick. Absolutely. I, the idea of like just a slight heart rate right before you begin that range of motion, dynamic stretching. Uh, and l let's not be so vague, I guess. Like static stretching means you're sitting there touching your toes. You're holding it for 20 seconds. Static stretching. That is not really the best thing to do for most athletic sports. If you're a, a yoga person and you're looking for great range of motion, more often than not, depth in movement is how you get more range of motion. Sure, static stretching can get you there after you're warmed up and those types of things. But when you're on the field and you're getting into those types of things, that little bit of a jog, you're already going to start with more range of motion than you would have just doing it cold turkey. Not to mention you're getting a little more blood flow, a little more oxygen in the muscles for those movements. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I don't think I've thought of that. I think that's something I'm going to add to it because later on, after I've done some of the dynamic warm up stuff, I'm going to go into the high knees and then I'll go into a sprint. I think that would help just get me started. 
Yeah, unfortunately, that's where laziness comes in. I, and I've been a part of it, too. You get to the ballpark, and it's like, I don't really want to jog this pole. Give me that ball. Let me flip it to you a little bit. <laughs> pole looks like a long ways yeah, out there. Yeah, but if you think about it, the idea that you're playing catch, you're moving constantly. Every body, every movement in your body is going to increase your blood flow. Your heart rate's going to increase. But quite frankly, your shoulder's getting a lot of stress playing baseball throwing a ball your elbows getting a lot of stress you're torquing to throw the ball so a lot of these types of things that you're doing as your warm-up man just give your body a little bit of blood flow before you start going through these torque movements that can lead to your injuries you know a lot of times people have bad front leg knees right so you land and you twist on your front knee well the first motion you're going to do to when you get to the park is throw a ball and twist on your knee you don't yes. think that maybe that might be problematic one day you know, you don't think about that, right? but that's something to keep in mind. Groin, Both, and, groin and hip, same thing, swinging a bat. Go throw a donut on a bat when you haven't warmed up at all. Say you've been doing it all along, never had a problem. That back hip, you have to pivot and twist on your back hip. You don't think that maybe a little bit of blood flow and some range of motion might have made that a little bit better than just putting on max tension and swinging through the zone? Well, I think your body's going to adjust, and it's going to adjust maybe in a negative way. I've noticed if I – get there late or we got to get out on the field and you go out there and your legs aren't warmed up then all of a sudden you start going your body's moving to adjust because your legs weren't ready right right it's almost whether you're working out or you're playing some kind of a recreational type of sport as you move on the rules remain the same if you're going to perform athletically you should warm up like an athlete warm up to get your body ready and then do these specific types of motions, throwing, hitting, those types of things require a warm body or you're going to just kind of hurt yourself one of these days, you know? So I like to say you start with a pole, start with a little bit of a run, a little weird at the golf course. I get it. Laziness will come in. You're probably not going <laughs> to do it. So find something to where you can get your heart rate up a little bit before you get in the tee box, before you do those things. Don't let high pressure torque swings get you loose. Does that make sense? It does. Well, I think even golf you just got to get there a few minutes early. Yeah. You know, if you're going to hit off the the practice tee, you're going to be there early, but that's a huge part of it. And so what? If if it makes me feel better or you feel better, go do it. Go run a pool. Well, it's kind of funny you think about professional athletes, and most people don't consider them professional athletes, right? I'm, a, I'm not a professional athlete. I'm just out here trying to play a little golf on Sunday. But those professional athletes have longevity because they warm up properly. And then your skills can shine without a kink in your armor. You don't have a funny knee, a funny hip, right? And not to mention that if you've got a little bit of a problem area, a good warm up can kind of hide that and subside that pain for quite a while. So when you do the golf course, imagine you've got a tight back. You're notorious for a tight back. One version of that day looks like I get to the tee box. I take some light swings. I'm trying to get my back loose. But what did you do? You start at ground zero with swinging right? And then you start getting into it by hole nine, hole 10. Ah, my back's tightening up again. Well, is it tightening up because you can't touch your toes at all? Are your hamstrings locked up and your glutes are locked up and they've been locked up all day, but you got your back loose enough to get through the ball? That's fine until your back gets a little fatigued and you couldn't use any of those other muscles because they're so locked up. That's kind of the point. The dynamic warm up kind of almost opens the door to, it shows you, you have some kinks in your armor. And then when you go outside of that day, you should be training to get rid of those kinks. You know, specifically, say this instance with your tight back. Have you ever had a tight back when you play golf? A look, more, usually it's more tight shoulders. Okay, so you got tight shoulders. Well, bad example than what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, go ahead. No, but, I... but you think when you, when you get a bad back, okay, and I get out there and I'm just doing my swinging, right? If you would notice that in your dynamic warm-up that you couldn't do an RDL, RDL means you've got one foot on the ground, you bend down and you see what kind of range of motion you can get as your back foot comes up. So imagine I set my left foot down on the ground and I bend down with a nice flat back and my right foot comes up at the same time. If you have zero range of motion and you're feeling it in your hamstring right out of the gates, that should be an indication that for like the next couple of weeks, you need to get your hamstrings loose because one day that hamstring is going to affect your back and then your golf swing, you're going to go, ho. Oh, my back is, I just, I just threw it out. I locked it up. And no, it's because your hamstrings have been basically making it so your body doesn't function right for how many years, how long, you know what I mean? And then your body's going to start compensating the wrong way. If you're off balance, 
now you've got to move your your upper body to compensate for that. So have, have you ever been to the park? You're about to play softball, and you notice right in the middle of your warm up something ain't right. And, and I don't mean something's injured. I mean, oh, this shoulder ain't feeling so hot today. Oh, absolutely, and especially if you've played three games the day before, right? Or you've had other activities that affect that. You're like, oh man. You know, I've had days where I get there and I think about what did I do? Because from the start, my legs feel like they're 100 pounds a piece. Right. Just heavy. Well, just a lot of overuse, tons of lactic acid as you get a little older. I'm sorry, but you're kind of not young and spry anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the mind says yeah. yes and the body says yeah. no. Oh, no, no. Not happening. <laughs> I have that happen a lot. Right, right. But when you think about that, so when you come from an athletic background, and I've used dynamic warm-ups all along to show you what you should be working on. That's what's kind of nice about them. So when you get to the park and you start noticing that your legs aren't acting right, you could, quite frankly, as much softball as you're playing, you need to be actively working to get those things going again before the next time you have to compete, right? right. So if you got a little kink in your arm or you got a little bit of shoulder, you feel it in your dynamic warm-up. Maybe that day during competition, you're not going to hose somebody out at second base and really give it 110% throw. You're going to take it easy a little bit. Then the next couple days, we'll be working some jobs, rolling through your five pound weight work to get your rotator cuff, a lot more blood flow in the area. That's what you can kind of learn about in this dynamic warm up. Does that make sense? It does. Well, if you, uh, so you mentioned the jog to the pole. Sure. What would you suggest to be the next step? So generally, I wouldn't personally, I wouldn't put bands on right out of the gate. Bands are going to be more of a, a muscle fiber activator, right? So if I jog to the pole, jog back, your heart rate most likely for most people, if you're a bit of an athlete, is not going to be through the roof, but it's going to be a little elevated, maybe 120, 130. And you use that heart rate to get all your range of motion. So you may start with some high lunges, meaning don't drop down to the knee so awful much. Have you ever, I mean, you know what I mean with a lunge, right? You've got a depth lunge where the back knee's nearly touching the grass. And then you've got, you know, kind of, you know, a just half, a little, walk just out a there. little just a little sink in the hip just a little bit, get the knee pivoting just a little bit and, and do everything in increments of like 10 to 15 yards. So you're going back and forth. Basically, you've got about eight, nine minutes and you'll be done with this thing. Lunges down, lunges back, keep all the ballistic movements out of it for a minute, right? Then maybe uh, the next time down, you'll do a lunge and a twist, start moving the trunk a little bit, not really cranking on her, just a little rotation. Uh, then on your way back, so you're going down back, you've got lunges, you've got the lunge and twist. Then you might come up and you might lift the knee and pull it to your chest a little bit. So you're standing on one foot, you raise your left leg up, you squeeze it to your chest. And again, if you're not super loose, it's probably not going very far, but that's okay. So as you get closer to the 15 yard mark, you're really kind of trying to pull that a little bit. Now we've getting range of motion in our hips. Now we're seeing the trunk move a little bit. And as you, you just kind of progressively move from joint to joint. So now we'll turn around on our way back. You do those walking RDLs, kick your foot out in the front, lets the hamstring release a little bit, let it swing through, pivot on that bottom foot. So let's say we're going to use our left foot. I take a step, put my left foot down, swing the right foot up and then let it go through. And as it comes through, you bend over at the waist. So now my hamstring is very straight on my left leg. Now I'm going to start loosening up my lower back, my hamstring, and my glutes. And then you'll alternate. Bring that foot back down, stand up straight, kick the left foot. Then you're on the right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you'll move down through, and now we've targeted our hips and our quads in our first, you know, uh, lunge sequence, got our trunk going on our second. Now our third, we're hitting back hamstrings and really trying to get a little bit more blood flow as your trunk gets moving up and down, you'll start feeling a little bit more blood flow. And now you start getting into a little bit more tempo, right? I'm going to shoot for 130 beats per minute, 140. So you may move into a light karaoke, then it might be a high knee, then it might be a butt kicker, then you might shuffle, shuffle, jog out 15 yards. Now at this point, Throw on K-bands because you're going to get extra muscle activation. And what's interesting about that concept is it's not exactly weight training if you use it as a warm-up, right? When you wear K-bands, you're going to get glute activation, 
quads when you go out front, hammies when you go out back. But if you just simply do some high knee and some shuffling types of exercises, now you kind of get in that upper level movement of activation without having to do any ballistic movements. That's the key, right? We're still trying to warm up. We don't right. want any, we don't right. need any explosive movements. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. So you think maybe what, a th do it about a third of the way through, half of the way through. And a lot of guys don't have them, don't have the bands or don't want to, and that's okay. It well, still works. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I would say that the, the benefit of using K-bands in that fashion is that it requires kind of sort of less effort, right, to get more muscle activation. It goes faster. Right, right. So if I'm going and I want to just get this thing over with, I get it. It's a warm I'm here to hit home runs. I'm here to play ball and hang out with my friends. So you're not really trying to have a 30 minute workout in the outfield, right? right. You're, you're trying to get through a little bit of a sequence. So just by going down and back, now you've got that mid-level heart rate. You're getting a lot of good range of motion. So rather than making anything ballistic, right? I don't have to crank on anything. I don't have to do heavy trunk twists. I don't have to put a uh, donut on the bat and really swing through the ball and put joints at risk that may be taking a minute to get moving. If you throw on a little bit of resistance bands, whether you're doing your shoulder work with KB power bands, whether you're doing K bands, getting your hips loose, th that's what it's all about. Now, all of a sudden, I'm able to do basic movements that are a lot less risky and I've got great muscle activation. So as you move through your sequence, you'll find, try that the next time you go to the park, run to a pole, kind of move through a little bit of that lower body stuff because your lower body will get the upper body moving because of the blood flow, right? Okay. Go through all those joints, throw on the bands, go through your high knees, some shuffles, some traditional movements, some squat knee ups that you mentioned before. And when you get through that sequence, I guarantee you, you'll feel a little bit better probably than just starting so cold. Because most of the time, if you take a warm up too far, too fast, you kind of just half ass it. You know yeah. what I mean? You kind of, oh, I'm not, it, this ain't coming around today. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> these legs are not coming today. So you kind of just, let it go and move on. All right, I guess it's time to start playing catch. But if you do it in a little bit more of a progressive fashion, they'll be there. You know what I've, I mean? I've noticed a few times when I didn't get really good and warmed up and I go, I play right field. You go out there and say, man, I hope they don't hit a gapper in the first <laughs> inning. Yeah, give me to the fourth, then yeah. hit something to me. Let me get warmed up that uh, yeah. I should have already done. I, do you find that most people, and I have, but do you find that most people use the game to warm up basically? I think so. Yeah. A, a lot of it is playing catch, maybe swinging the bat, maybe a little bit of running. Usually most guys our age are going to have batting practice before the game. That's probably the most dynamic that it will get for right. a lot of them. You see the other guys off to the side doing things, but right. it's, yeah, now I'm fired up by the third inning, but man, you'll, you'll feel better and I think your performance will be better. It, it it most definitely will. And not to mention, you're going to know your problem areas. So as I said earlier, and I cannot stress this enough, if you've got kinks in your armor that you feel during a dynamic warm-up, you got to work on those areas because they're going to cause an injury. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, absolutely. If you feel that hammy tweaking now, think about when you take off for that first sprint. Right. And it's painful. I Do remember. you use the dynamic warm-up when you're exercising outside of competition? Like, you're not doing softball this weekend, no tournaments. You're working out this week. You got three workouts. Are you doing a dynamic warm-up before those as well? Yes, I do. I probably don't go as intense as I should or long enough. But, yeah, you just kind of have that, well, I got to get in here and start. One question I would have is that I, if I'm going to do, like, bike day, okay, because that's a good cardio, it's getting the legs going, but low impact, should I do that first or last? Uh, what else are you doing that day? That's probably... Well, you, I might be lifting, whether it be band work today or machine work or, f say, free weights, but then I usually leave the bike till last. Should I do that? That almost seems like a better dynamic warm-up, doesn't it? Uh, well, yeah, I would say both ways. So if you're doing it all stacked up and it's not a split workout, like some people like to do cardio separate from training. Uh, and if you're doing it that way, I don't know that it really matters as long as there's a gap, but absolutely. A bike can be a great version of that first pole, right? Right. You use the bike as the pole method. So when you get in there, you hop on the bike, you've got no resistance to it. Don't crank it up. And you're just getting a nice little deal, you know, two, three minutes, get everything moving a little bit. And then you can get into some range of motion dynamic. It's basically structured or should be structured the same way because you're not doing, 
the exercise is not as important as the muscles you're targeting. Does that make sense? Yes. The jog. So if you were to set your template for everyone out there that's going to do any kind of recreational activity and does not want to get hurt and really kind of takes it serious, which I would think are guys like me and you, right? Right. For every single format, the template is simple. A little bit of heart rate for two or three minutes, medium to low. You're just trying to get a little heart rate. Run a pole, ride a bike, do a little bit of jumping jacks. Maybe you like to dance. I mean, it can be anything. Move your body a little bit, two, three minutes. Okay, now we're there. Now we got to get our hips moving, quads and hamstrings so that we can loosen up our back. Because most things that people like to do have to rotate, right? Right. But you don't want to start with the back because the hamstrings are going to affect the back. So we like to get them loose too. So you're going to start with hips in some kind of a lunge fashion, sliding from side to side. If lunges are too difficult, grab a pole, grab the edge of the fence, grab anything, do slight side lunges to start moving the hips. Use things to negate the amount of weight that you have. If you need less weight on your body, you're overweight and you can't get any range of motion, that doesn't mean that you're not going to use your hamstrings. You know what I'm saying? Oh, sure. You still got to move them just because you're too heavy. So use other objects to make your body a little bit lighter. But again, you get the warm up. Now you're moving through lower body, lower extremities, getting more range of motion. Then you kind of work your way to the top. You get your trunk, get it nice and loose. Then you're working shoulders. I like to use the resistance band style method that we were talking about with K bands. But with the shoulder, you know, you can grab some five pound dumbbells or something extremely light and run through some Job's nice, easy three second counts on the way down. And you're really going to warm everything up to a, a place that you can build muscle if you're exercising. Uh, get into a, a cardio style thing that you're talking about, or if you're going to compete, you're already ready. But you, for the bike example that you asked about, you can use it as a warm up. but I tend to always use that cardio stuff at the very end of like weight training. So if you're talking about weight training, you know, you kind of want to save it for the end because it's a little bit monotonous and you don't want to be exhausted when you're weight training. True. Yeah. Do you, do you find yourself trying to like build up or do the same types of things with your bike stuff? Uh, like, do you do 20 minutes one day, the next time you're doing it, you're trying to do 30, or you're, are you just kind of a standard? I rotate everything, including that, so I might want to go 20 minutes one time, maybe at a little bit lower level, then the next time go at a, you know, increase that level so it's, you know, more resistance, harder to do, uh, and go at it for less time so that I change it up. And I do that with all my workouts. Yeah, every exercise you should always be trying to get – progressively better. You know what I mean? No matter yeah. what you're doing, if you can get your mind locked into, you know, today I'm going 20 minutes at X resistance level. Next time, maybe you go 20 minutes at an increased resistance level or vice versa intervals. Just keep mixing it up. They'll keep things interesting for you. You know, one thing that I think I'm going to add, I have some friends that do it is I'm going to get a bike. I'm going to start get... riding a, a bike and outdoor, indoor, outdoor. It doesn't matter. Uh, probably both. Yeah. I mean, is one better than the other? You know, I've got a, a sit down bike in my basement, you know, one of the, um, and then I have a mountain bike that I got really big into several years ago. I was going through trails and everything else. And there's a whole world out there of like advanced level bike riding. That's an awful lot of fun. I don't know if you've tried mountain biking or anything like that, but there are trails all throughout our city that, uh, you can get off road and, and, you know, probably get in little hairy situations. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to be a bit of a, you got to have a good balance. You have to be able to bike, but I really enjoyed, you know, getting out and seeing nature more so than just plugging away, you know, on a, on a standstill in your house. Keep in mind, you have to go back. Well, oh, so if yeah, you go yeah, three yeah. miles out, it's three miles <laughs> yeah. back. I might be there. downhill, but I've been there. I went on this uh, bike ride one time. Uh, there's a trail that I can take around my house that goes like close to a, a park, and they have bike trails there. And I went around the second park, so I would live in this weird kind of deal where a park butts up against my house, and then across kind of like a semi highway deal, there's another park. So I took this whole loop and this whole loop was about four and a half hours. And I mean, I'm biking, biking, you know, 25, 26 gears, whatever it is. And I'm, I'm going, I'm probably going 15, 25 miles an hour in some pieces. I could barely peel my butt off the seat. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, that seat was so far up my butt by the time I got back, it was not enjoyable. I think all of us have that one memory. Mine would be cross country skiing, never again. So you but were it was, cross country. You mean the real deal? The real like, deal. You're walking it almost, right? I kind of got 
shamed into it. And that's, I have a whole new respect for those. How people. many hours was it? What was the distance? It was, I think, six miles. And it's just brutal. Yeah. How long did it take you? It's like five hours. Oh, boy. I'm not doing that four-minute mile. I can tell you that. Now, is that is that literally the whole time you're working? There's no, like, ski involved, correct? I mean, not really. You might get a little bit of a 10-foot slope and then realize that the next one is uphill. Right. So, <laughs> so you basically are walking in the snow for six miles. Oh, when I got done, I don't think I've ever just collapsed. <laughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well that's crazy was but it at least scenery or anything it was kept beautiful going? scenery and it was fun i love the snow and i was kind of proud that i could finish literally finish was it some type of race or you just no it was just uh we were with another guy that had always wanted to do it and no one would do it and i said nah, i'll go with you <laughs> next time he's going by himself <laughs> did you find i've always wondered are the poles like they don't it help, help it, it's it balance so it literally you can get a little push so more or less, it's literally your legs. It's are, your legs and, and getting a little bit of a lean forward and being balanced. Man. And it's hard. Every It's like there's no, you get extension and flexion and everything, and it's just For five constant. hours. Uh, I sat down a couple times. I bet you did. Uh, yeah. Can you get out of those boots easy? I know when you're snow skiing, like that's almost one of the hardest things to do is figure out how you're doing these boots things without falling on your head. <laughs> well, if you do that during the trail, then you got to get them back on. Sure, sure. So now that was a good experience, though. I would better on a snowmobile, though. Oh, don't get me into snowmobiling. Mobiling? Yeah. Um, I enjoy. Cool. Uh, I like. I've been on a snowmobile trip, and it, it was pretty cool. And, and just like biking, in a sense, I really like that whole going through the woods thing. I don't know what it is about me, but I, I really like you know flying through the woods, seeing so much. There's so much action. It's just uh, exciting while you get your workout. I would get into biking. Is that something you're into? I'm gonna. I've got a couple friends that do it, and I they do a lot of posts on Facebook showing the route that they took and how street? many miles. Uh, they'll they'll do parks or street. A little bit of everything. So they have actually mountain bikes or do they have skinny tire street bikes? I think they're mountain bikes. I'm not yeah. for sure. But yeah, I, I mean, I feel like growing up, you ride bikes. You love bikes, right? Everyone's got a bike. You're doing some hops. If you're a daredevil, you're doing some crazy stuff. But somewhere in there, the bike's just not that cool as you get older and you get into cars and all that stuff. But when you get to a certain point, dude, if you can get on a bike and get out there and get your heart rate going... You feel good. Your legs are, you know, really getting some great exercise and you can get in a scenery setting. It's a lot of fun. I would highly recommend getting off the main roads and get into the woods because well, it's you, pretty cool. It's uh, for me, it's you can see the scenery better than I can if I'm jogging or running. And well, you cover more ground. You get to see yeah. more stuff. And there's not the impact. Right. Impact's a huge issue that people don't think about. Now, they got to do some serious innovations on those seats let me tell oh, you oh well yeah <laughs> uh, i haven't worn the butt pads i've seen them i just kind of like couldn't embrace it i've seen more cushiony seats but every time you see some hardcore rider you know they're just like sit on that thing you know so i don't know i just never tried it but there's got to be something better you, you literally get a calloused butt i mean i was riding probably four days a week two three hour rides every time and i was grinding this before i had kids so you know, on a Saturday, I wake up at 7, ride till 10.30 all the time. And they got to get some butt innovations for sure. I'll check into that for you. Yeah. I'll see what my guys do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would love to know. I mean, the first time you get on that puppy, you'll know. You better set that stopwatch 30 minutes. You better be cool in it. <laughs> you better be cool in it. And you better not be not halfway back when you decide that, yeah, this was a little more work than I thought. But that's an, that's a really good example, too, of like a dynamic warm-up, right? So I can relate to these guys. When you get out there, you can use the bike as your warm-up, right? You get on it, and you kind of just start slow. You don't really work too hard up hills. You always work in a low gear so that you kind of slowly or surely going along. But let me tell you, when you ride three days that week and you've put on about eight hours on that bike, if you don't warm up, your back is killing you on your third day. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. The longevity of you being able to do things is so essential to warm up in any of these types of exercises. All it required was a little bit of heart rate, a little bit of range of motion, get those hamstrings to relax a little bit. Then you get on the bike and you're good to go. I mean, I learned that the hard way. 
I mean, I learned everything the hard way, you know, I was biking consistently. And then I found that, man, my back was just starting to really roast me at maybe an hour and a half in later in the week. Right. So I'd got on a bit of a, you know, I'd go Monday, like a Wednesday. And then by Saturday, my back would be on fire. And then all I started doing different was, I guess this is going to be like everything else. If, if you're going to do it a lot, I guess I got to warm up. And I started warming up a little bit before I got on the bike and got that, you know, seat rod out of my butt, you know, long, <laughs> it's tough to get warmed up with that thing when you already got a tender hiney, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah. So I started warming up and even that it was, uh, you just have much better longevity finding all the kinks in your armor during a warm up. It really does help a ton. Well, I think the key is get moving and have some sort of a plan, and then maybe you modify it towards what you're going to be doing after you do the warm-up. Absolutely. It, yeah, it, with the softball scenario, it's not that you're not playing catch and swinging a weighted bat. It's that you stuck 10 minutes of, let me get my athletic body loose, and then you do those exercises. You know what I mean? Then you get sports-specifically loose. Right, and then I'm ready to go. Well, that wraps it up today. Be sure that you get out there and warm up a little bit before you compete. Go to kbandstraining.com if you need specific dynamic warm-ups. Use the search bar, type in dynamic warm-up. I've got tons of demos that you can utilize there.